welcome and really, well, fabulous to see you all. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be chairing this session. Uh, my name is John Smith. I'm an interventional oncology radiologist based in Leeds. I'm also the Royal College of Radiology um, chair and um, uh, Royal College of Radiology, uh, Radiology Events and Learning Chair and Newsletter Editor, which addresses errors and communicates errors to our uh, to our 13,000 members. Um, I would like to introduce the panel members. So firstly, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sir David. Um, Sir, Sir David Spieverholter was knighted 11, 11 years ago for his work in statistics. His last professorial post was the Winton Professor of Public Understanding of Risk and Communicating Risk to Patients, which is our business. Uh, next, we have Professor Kuprinsky from Emory University, Atlanta. Uh, Professor Kuprinsky is Vice Chair for Research in Radiology and Imaging based in Atlanta. And Professor Kuprinsky has been studying how and why radiologists fail, fail um, and published many peer-reviewed articles, some of which uh, together with our next speaker, Professor Mike Bruno. So Professor Bruno is the Professor of Radiology and Medicine at Penn State, again in the US. Um, and uh, Professor Kaprinsky and Professor Bruno are two leading lights on understanding errors in radiology. And um, so, and finally, we have Joe in the background who's giving us a bit of support. And so uh, if you would like to open the session, uh, Sir David, and uh, look forward to your uh, 10 minute talk. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> great. Thank you very much indeed for the introduction. Um, I, I, I do feel a bit fraudulent being here because um, in my experience of radiology as being a subject of it rather than being a practitioner or, or, or really um, to work on diagnostic errors. So I, I hope if I just talk about some of our general approach to work to communication and the projects we've been involved in, um, I hope there are some relevant um, points that can be picked up later. So I'm going to share my screen for about 10 minutes, if that's all right. Um, tell me that that's working. Is that working OK? Yes, see it beautiful. Oh, right. Okay. So that's me. And you know, I've written some books, Art of Stats and COVID by Numbers, but but it generally shows that I'm I'm just, you know, my work has been for many years now to do with explaining quite tricky concepts to uh to the public and to advising on projects which are to do with explaining risk and uncertainty to people. Um I'd like to go just go back to the guidelines on consent. I'm going to be talking mainly about interventions here rather than diagnoses. But the General Medical Council's guidelines on consent are quite interesting um, the, about you know, the, uh, the information they want or need to make a decision is the crucial thing, which might include diagnosis and prognosis, uncertainties about diagnosis, diagnosis or prognosis, options, and um, in particular, E, I'd like to point out the, the potential benefits, risks of harm, uncertainties about the likelihood of success of each option including the options to take no action. So um, this is what we've mainly concerned with, the whole business of, at, at a point of, of, a, of, a, of an intervention, what to do. And we've been designing decision aids for the NHS and some other projects which I'll, which I'll talk about. Um, I've got a particular interest in this because I got diagnosed with prostate cancer about six, seven years ago. And so I've been through this whole process and um, and I don't think I dealt very well with it. So uh, I'm, I'm interested in improving the whole way these things are done. Um, we, we wrote a paper in Nature a few years ago, um, which tried to kind of summarize our, our, in a way, almost we call it our manifesto on communicating evidence which means you know any information that helps people make make decisions and one of our crucial things was that you know unless we're in particular situations where we are absolutely confident about what's best for someone and willing to take on a paternalistic role we should be informing rather than persuading and that means having a balance not 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 a false balance and these issues apply to everything so we could talk about climate communicating risks of climate change well we don't want to have a false balance or climate change yes no you know but actually having a balance of benefits and harms winners and losers to be upfront about uncertainties what we don't know and and the four is, number four is something i feel very strongly about is to be upfront about the quality of the underlying evidence that we've got and so to have that humility to acknowledge when we just don't know enough to be almost to be confident about saying very much. Um, and number five is quite interesting that we push quite a lot is is actually though the one thing you can be confident about is when 
there is misinformation out there there are misunderstandings and to hit them hard don't don't let them fly away really correct misunderstandings preempt them in fact before people hear them themselves um, so informing or persuading is the crucial thing. Um, you know, our aim is an informed health choice rather than trying to manipulate someone to change their behavior. And the process then is co-producing material as far as possible with patients. That's what we've done. Checking their cognitive, affective and behavioral impact. And this is all our work with the, um, with the psychologists that we work with. Um, rather than using marketing strategies, nudges, etc., Format would tend to be using absolute risks when the numbers are available, um, rather than relative risks to say how much we, we know that telling people this increases your risk by X percent is a fairly manipulative form of communication. Framing to report benefits and harms properly, rather than just emphasizing the benefits of action, the harms of inaction. And success is improving understanding and decision satisfaction, not changing behavior in a particular direction. And the crucial thing is that we get lots of people coming to us saying, we want to inform people, but you realize actually they want to persuade people because their performance indicators are what people do rather than how they actually felt about the decision. Okay, so that's that. Um, just an ex two examples I just want to go through of how we've been trying to work to put that into action. One was during COVID, talking about the potential benefits and harms of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which in, in April 2021 was being linked to blood clots you know, very severe ones, particularly in younger people. And we work with the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Jonathan Van Tam, who's a highly trusted figure, fortunately. Um, we got the data on the on the side effects on the Monday. We worked, you know, pretty well solidly preparing some graphics and then uh, talked to him on Wednesday morning. And this all went live on the BBC on Wednesday afternoon. And this was our main graphic that we produced. And what I want to point about this is that it is complicated because... COVID is complicated and the vaccines are complicated and the benefits and harms. But it's got this idea of the balance, the benefits on the left, the, the harms on the right, um, serious harms. This is the blood clots, potential benefits, ICU admissions prevented, roughly equivalent in size. But the crucial thing is, there's no point in talking about averages for any of these. And we have to stratify. We have to not exactly personalize. I wouldn't say that. We have to stratify into particularly age in this context. I'm in the bottom group where the benefits clearly outweigh the harms. But as you get younger, the benefits go down rather sharply and the harms go up as you get younger. So he showed this and I was amazed, went through it on the BBC live, you know, to, to a general audience and then concluded at the end. So we're not recommending the vaccine for the under 30s. And Everyone accepted that. There wasn't any pushback. Thank you very much for explaining it. And it's a very complex and subtle issue that he was he was describing. And that format then was copied by everybody around the world, by European medical um, um, uh, medical agency. It's in Italian there. It's all sorts of stuff. So um, it, it, it basically it worked. Actually, <laughs> it just worked by doing these things, trying to do these things properly. So my other example, before I finish, is about PREDICT, which is a system that um, we've developed the front end of this with our psychologists and our web designers to, uh, this is for women newly diagnosed with breast cancer, and this one for prostate cancer now. And anyone can use this. Um, it's used extensively. It's used um, uh, 30,000 times a month for women with breast cancer. Well, it's 1,000 times a day around the world. And essentially, you put in the normal kind of idea. You put in various details about, about the patient and about the treatment options. Um, and uh, there's a statistical model behind that, which comes up with actuarial survival curves, which are then presented in all sorts of different ways. There's no correct way. So this is the first lesson. There's no correct way to communicate benefits and harms. Um, it depends on the audience. Uh, doctors tend to just want a simple table. That one down at the bottom is really for the for the um, multidisciplinary team meetings um, where they just want to know what's the overall survival at 15 years for surgery only and how does that increase with the different treatments that could be given. But then there's all sorts of other options. Actually, I like survival curves and surprising number of patients actually can grasp a survival curve. And um, what I like about the survival curves in this case is that it puts in the dash line, which is the survival rate if you excluded deaths from breast cancer. In other words, this is as high as you could ever get, even if the woman was guaranteed to be cured. And so that's the sort of room for maneuver that one's got. But we show it as bar charts. These are quite, I think, quite difficult to understand. Text. 
What does it mean for 100 women? Icons, again, what does it mean for 100 women? So again, this is standard ways that have been um, evaluated by psychologists in many experiments that what does it mean for 100 people um, is, is an extremely good, who have ticked the sort of boxes that you've ticked, is an extremely good way of communicating. We don't use little people. Um, again, experiments showing that actually little people, and we used to have the the deaths from other causes the big black blobs and that was too distressing distracting to people so we've had to alter the formats and there's one for prostate which i wish i'd had when i'd been diagnosed god i wish i'd had this um and um which also deals with with side effects the side effects of breast cancer one will be out soon so um that's really it so my conclusions are from our experience is that we're now in the UK, because of the Montgomery judgment, legally obliged to communicate the potential benefits and harms of treatment and those benefits and harms that are relevant to the patient rather than what the medical profession think are, are appropriate. Now, how do we do that? Well, I think one should use numbers as ballpark figures when they are available. Words alone can be so easily misunderstood by people. What common means means very different things to different people. So um, I think uh, numbers where possible, but they're only ever ballparks. And the way, best way to communicate these things, it's been shown repeatedly to use a common denominator out of 100 or out of 1,000 people, what we'd expect, what we'd roughly expect. It's not, we never use the word probability or chance. We never say it's your risk. It's not your risk. Every individual is unique and, and special. All the statistics can do is say, out of 100 people who are similar to you in these characteristics. But then crucially acknowledge the uncertainty that we have, the uniqueness of each individual, and to adapt any detail that's communicated to the level of interest and, um, and understanding of the individual in front. So this is not a purely algorithmic process. Different people want different levels of detail. So um, I'm going to stop there. And I kind of just hope that some of that has resonated slightly with the work that you do. So thank you very much for letting me go on. Yeah. Just to mute myself. Thank you, Sir David. That was um, a really interesting uh, summary of a, a huge amount of work that um, you've been participating and leading on, not only from a local, but national and international level. So uh, uh, brilliant work, really. Um, if it's OK with Sir David, would uh, I'd like to open the uh, session by or, uh, asking a few questions and so we have uh, Professor Bruno and Professor Koprinski and so Professor Koprinski or Professor Bruno would you like to start the um, the questions uh, who would like to start there ladies first or, or Mike's got a hand up is that okay <laughs> Professor Koprinski or would you absolutely like now he can go well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Sir David. That was that was wonderful, and it really does comport exactly with with the kinds of things that we've been worried about and thinking about and working on. Uh, the great Osler said, "Medicine is the science of uncertainty and an art of probability." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but physicians in general uh, have a hard time with concepts of uncertainty and probability. Psychologically, uncertainty is just as difficult for doctors as it is for everyone else, yeah, yeah. and they don't have a, a, a strong grasp of uh, of probability, um, and they tend to dichotomize. They tend to you know to make everything up or down. So I'm I'm wondering what advice you can give us as teaching physicians. Uh, and uh, and to the profession as a whole, as we communicate this out, uh, uh, to deal with with this, uh, I, don't, I don't want to call it a numeracy because they're they're numerate, but but yeah. uh, the struggle with with probability and uncertainty. Yeah. I think I think a lot of it is you know some of it is that some of the concepts are quite tricky. You know the sort of false positive rates and what it relates to predictive values and so on. Actually, it's quite complex. But I think it's deeper than that. I think it's it is a reluctance to acknowledge uncertainty as a professional, perhaps in front of a patient. So it's to do with that relationship. And I think this is something that needs to be countered. I think that medicine is changing from a paternalistic model to a shared decision making model and that patients accept that. Now, some still would welcome, well, what do you think I should do? And they want a confident judge, you know, statement and they want to be essentially told what to do. But an increasing number want to engage with their decision and actually will respect the, the acknowledgement of uncertainty. And our, our um, you know, all our experiences suggest that people, you know, when they are 
you know, trusted in that way that they can deal with the uncertainty, deal very well with it. Um, and I think that uh, maybe maybe what would be good to say, you shouldn't be like politicians. Politicians are the worst. I mean, they are absolutely stuck in a mould of having to be absolutely confident about everything they can do. And then never can, they can never change their minds because they, they're accused of a U-turn. They're impossible. They, they're incapable of admitting uncertainty, of provisionality. Well, we'll try this. And if it doesn't work, we'll move on to something else. They cannot. They cannot. You know, it's not a part of their language. And I think a lot of this is to do with language of finding the right terms um, to in order to exp just because you're uncertain doesn't mean you haven't got a clue or your guess is as good as mine. You know, you can be especially if you can quantify the uncertainty. That's great. That's good. Very, even very roughly. But even being able to say, well, we're not quite we're not sure about this. We haven't we got completely confident. That's why we're doing some extra investigations or we you know we can only provisionally describe that. I mean, this seems to me just basic humanity not from anything else. And I think that in a way it's giving any professionals, not just doctors, professionals, the confidence that it's OK to have some. Humanity. And that doesn't mean that people will distrust you or just lose all their respect for you. Um, so I, I do think this is quite an important, fairly basic idea that goes beyond just numeracy. Uh, Professor Bruno, would you like to um, ask another question or uh, uh, or extend on that? Or would you like uh, Professor Kaprinsky to come in? Or, or just disagree. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't disagree at all. I think that, that that's wonderful advice. And you know, learning to live with uncertainty is something yep. that, uh, that, that we need to do in medicine. And we're very, very poor at it. And it leads to over-testing. Yep. Uh, it leads to a conflating a test result with a diagnosis rather than having a diagnostic hypothesis. Um, and the other thing is that one can be actually uncertain. Um, well, we can be in, always, we can be pretty certain what's going on, but uncertain what to do because we need to take into account the values and the concerns of the patient and so on. But oh, all we can be actually not quite sure what's going on, but we can be fairly confident about what the actual best action to take at the moment. You know, so I think uh, we also need to separate out our understanding from from the decision that these also need some fairly clear separation. Uh, Professor Kaprinsky, would you like to ask a question or? Um, yeah. Um... No, absolutely. And actually, it's a two part question, but I'm going to ask part one first and then follow it up with a slightly different scenario. So, you know, everybody here on this panel understands that physicians make mistakes, um, that it's inevitable. I mean, you know, physicians are human beings. Um, everybody in healthcare is, and that, that mistakes can be made. Um, you put two radiologists, have them look at the same image. There's estimates that error rates are, you know, 30% in some cases, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. You put two dermatologists in the same room with the same patient, they're going to potentially come up with different diagnoses. Uh, how do we communicate this, what seems to be, um, to some patients, I would think almost, you know, a level of incompetence or a level of bad training. Um, you know, why can't those darn doctors agree with each other? You know, wh where's the evidence? What are they agreeing upon? So how do we communicate that inherent level of uncertainty, of risk, of, uh, you know, natural inter-observer variation uh, to patients without leading to the consequence of, well, I'm just going to go doctor shopping until I get the answer that yeah. I want. Yeah. That is terribly difficult. And I feel again that personally myself is that I before my diagnosis, I I, I don't, it's like so many people thought that medicine was a monolithic culture where everyone believed the same thing and it didn't matter who I talked to and so on. And I rapidly found out, or maybe not too rapidly, uh, rapidly enough, that it did depend who you went to and who you talked to. What what you know, and you go somewhere else, even in the certainly go to a different hospital, but you go to someone in the same hospital and you and different things will happen to you. I think that is is an, that is an extreme challenge because I really think there is a, um, a, a, a you know a, a very deeply embedded belief in people that there is some doctors say you know medicine says and this stuff that there is that. and that um, actually acknowledging that there's a lot of variability and um, both in terms of diagnoses and and judgments about what should be done is difficult to deal with as a um yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm not quite sure what to, what to. I mean, I think one of the first things one could do, of course, is to personalize the the judgments that are being made and make it clear that this is my judgment. I mean, that's at least then more honest rather than saying mm -hmm. this shows X. 
um, to just change the language to my judgment is that this shows X. I think that is the first step, you know, in terms of that honesty. Um, and the other thing is a personal thing that if, I mean, obviously there'll be more confidence about some judgments than others, but that, you know, purely as a pragmatic thing, that second opinions could be sought in, in areas where there was, where someone actually had the, you know, the insight to acknowledge the uncertainty rather than feeling that in a way admitting to the patient, I'd like someone else to have a look at this, you know, was a failure or, you know, would mean that, you know, this was meant, oh, well, they won't, as you said, they'll just go off and talk to somebody else who knows. Um, and this is, this issue, we're talking about patients and doctors, happens all the time as well as scientific advice to governments. People say, oh my God, no, scientists, we can't admit we're uncertain because they'll just go and find a scientist who is certain. And that happened in COVID in the UK. They did go, the, the government went scientist shopping. <laughs> right. <laughs> they did, you know, calling them in the ones they thought would say what they wanted to say. So there is that danger that that will happen. But there's no excuse. I don't think there's no excuse to be overconfident and to be uh, to overclaim one's certainty, because that is really dangerous. Well, here's the follow up question then. Mm. So the biggest well, thing difficult... now in in medicine, in radiology and probably the world is artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're incorporating that into the clinical yeah. workflow. and. Yeah. You just said, okay, let's personalize our reports, take ownership. Yep. Where does the opinion, which is probability based, yep. which is statistically based, I mean, all these models are based on probabilities and yep. statistics and the information that initially gets fed into training them. Yep. How does the radiologist or any other physician incorporate that into yep. their decision and take ownership of that? Um, and do we run the risk potentially I mean, how do we balance the uncertainty in now everybody understands physicians are in, not infallible, mm. but we have such confidence in computers these days. Yeah. Well, uh, it can guide me from, you know, here to the grocery store in a town yeah. I've never been to. I trust the computer. Oh. How do we balance that communicating the people? The unnatural uncertainty in the computer prediction. Oh, oh, just, you know, can you imagine? I mean, I wouldn't say the future because it was probably happening now that people just come into the surgery waving their chat GPT out, right. <laughs> saying, look, it says I've got <laughs> this disease. Right. And, you know, and chat GPT just makes stuff up if it feels like it. So, um, so I, I, this is an incredibly important issue. And of course, we're confronted with that already. Our predict system, I wouldn't call it AI, but it, to all intents and purposes it is, it sits in the corner of the multidisciplinary team meeting spouting out its judgments, and it's taken very seriously indeed. And we have actively tried to reduce trust in it. It's one of the big problems we found, even with Predict, is that there's over-trust in what the computer says. So people think, oh, you know, Predict said X. No, it only, it only knows about the things, those boxes that are ticked at the beginning. There's loads of it. It hasn't got anything about functional status, about obesity, about all other characteristics that could, could have a big influence on the treatment decisions. No, they're not in there. So we have to keep on saying this is limited. This is, this is only using these pieces of information. It's only a ballpark figure. You have to adjust it or individual circumstances. So I think that, and we try, so in other words, we're trying to make its output as trustworthy as possible, in particular, knowing when it doesn't know, et cetera. I think this is absolutely essential for algorithms in health in general. I get, so I, I've got a whole talk, which I won't do now, but a whole talk on trust in algorithms that goes through all of this about how it's absolutely essential that we can not only trust you know, on average, the claims made about algorithms, but on individual cases, it produces a trustworthy judgment. And that means acknowledging when it doesn't know, being able to express uncertainty. Um, and almost, you know, knowing what it doesn't know, knowing its own inadequacies and communicating that so that it is just the machine in the corner goes pop and something pops out. And, and then it's the responsibility, of course, of the physicians to how much notice they take to take it seriously or not. If, it, if it's reliable, it has been proven experimentally to come up with good, well calibrated judgments on, on, on average, then that's good, but they still have to adjust it. Um, so that's machines being used by the medical profession. And I think that that is, is absolutely essential. Now, the problem with, you know, as amazing recent developments is now these are on, we can all access this stuff. It just goes, bleh. out it comes, chat GPT. It's, 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 you know, it's brilliant 
it's, it's reversed 40 years of progress on uncertainty in artificial intelligence. I've been working on uncertainty in AI for 40 years, and it's completely negated all of that. It has no concept of what it knows or what, what it doesn't know. It states everything with complete confidence, even if it's just made it up. I mean, this is, in a sense, complete disaster, even though, and <laughs> even if it can, you know, write it in the style of Gilbert and Sullivan, you can't, which is brilliant, but it's not actually, you don't know how good it is. You don't know how much to trust it. So I think that this is a, a, a terribly important uh, time that we're all going to have to face up with. Um, and that the trustworthiness of algorithms and how to sense police that or assess that is a crucial issue. I think, you know, whether that's through regulation, through guidance or whatever, I just don't know the best way to do it. But it is terribly important. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I agree. I mean, we're, we're in the middle of a study right now where we're looking at presenting an image to a radiologist, getting yeah. their decision and then showing them the AI. And we're showing mm. it in different ways. One is mm. a heat map, yeah. which is, you know, heat maps are basically, you know, showing the pixels that the computer used to render their decision. Yeah. We're using little graphs that show it's, this is for COVID. So it shows probability of mild, moderate, severe, yeah, yeah, with yeah. scale on the side. Yeah. And then it just spits out a word, mild, moderate, yeah. severe. And these yeah, are different yeah, choices. Yeah. And no, it's amazing no. to see wow. how each one is interacting in a very different way with the radiologist. Yeah, presenting yeah, yeah. them with a picture and probabilities, a graphic picture with probabilities, is so far looking like it may lead to more decision changes than a heat map. A heat yeah. map just kind of confirms, oh yeah, look, it's red there, and that's where I was looking. Yeah, 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 yeah. And a single word, yeah. you know, is not as convincing. Oh, I, well, I mean, I know what I, you know, I would wait for the experimental results, but I know what it should have, which is the full information with with quantified uncertainty. Where if you've got it, which is, means it's a where it means it's a decent AI system, if it'll right. give you a proper calibrated measure of uncertainty that, that you know that actually you know means something. I think that I think actually to not use that would be um, you know taking unnecessary risks. We know that people interpret words in so many ways. We're trying to get away from this overconfident statement, particularly from an algorithm. And so, um, I whatever you find, I hope you end up, uh, you know, recommending the system that's got as much subtlety in it as possible. People can always. I mean, the other thing, of course, is as we showed in predict, there's no single way of doing this. You can do multiple levels of. of you can do gist, and you can do more explanation if, if necessary. But um, again, our all our you know, uh, experimental work, you know, suggests that actually having that degree of of nuance, um, the personalization, the uncertainty, the balance, um, in, in, increases the trust in the source, and people can deal with it on the whole, um, whether they're public or, or, or professional. So anyway, so I hope I know, I shouldn't try to influence your results, of course, but I, I do, I know what I hope you find. <laughs> No, I, no, I, I agree. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it is, you know, what's the most straightforward information and I'm going to follow it up with one more. I'm just going, cause since we do, we do have the time. Um, there are cases and I, I just heard of one just recently where the AI that the, the radiologist came, this is a patient coming in saying they were having, you know, abdominal discomfort and so on. And so they did all the imaging and stuff. Absolutely nothing. Second opinion, absolutely nothing. Uh, the AI came in and said, you know, I, I think this patient has pancreatic cancer. Everybody went back, looked at the images, looked at the images, can't see it. Fundamentally, the AI is looking at things that the human is not mm -hmm. and potentially seeing things the human is not. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of like the analogy that I just gave at a recent talk was, you know, we look at flowers and we see pretty little yellow flowers yeah, yeah yeah a bee or a bird looks at the flower and they see yeah. all this ultraviolet light and it looks yeah. totally different yeah. and i'm sitting there well why can't we present to the human not just what the pixels are contributing because that's useless why can't we figure out a way to fundamentally change the nature of the image to show the reader what the computer is finding because this oh, patient was sent home yeah. Came but, back six months later, still experiencing problems. And by then, the cancer had advanced to the point where the radiologist could see it in the images. Yeah, yeah. So how do you deal with this fundamental problem that maybe these AI schemes really are better than human beings? And how do we tell the poor patient, 
sorry, well, we just couldn't figure it out six months ago. Yeah. The computer said, yeah, but what would we have done anyway? Yeah. We can't I mean, figure I'm, it out because we can't see it. We can't treat it with radiation because you got to know where it, is. where it is. We can put you on chemo, but boy, that's an extreme. You, you, you wouldn't want to do that without. Right. Fun. Yeah. So, so where do, how do we I, communicate I, I, things like well, that? Well, the first thing, yeah, no, it's really tricky. The first thing I'd want to know is how many times it says someone's got pancreatic cancer. So, you know, you're telling me about one case, which is terribly important, but if it's, if it's crying wolf all the time, then it makes it far less reliable. So it should have a measure of confidence in that, or there should be some external calibration about, you know, how reliable its statement is, how seriously to take that. Um, but the other issue you're talking about is, you know, it's sometimes called local explainability, that it's, you know, able to, able to kind of explain, to structure its, its argument about why it reached that, to make that information accessible to, to humans. That's, that's tricky. I mean, you can do that in statistical systems, but in a, you know, in a sort of really deep net, neural network, that becomes almost impossible to do. And that to get, I mean, people are really working, as you know. To make these systems be able to explain themselves as much as possible, like yeah, what pixels is it particularly using? But um, very difficult, and you know, pretty limited to be able to do that if it's spotting something that people just are not used to spotting. So I, I'm sure this can happen. I would kind of want to know what its false positive rate was um, before taking that too taking it too seriously. Um, and uh, and I think it will be difficult to always expect to. A detailed explanation i think there's you know we're going to have some things where there will be always a measure some doubts some concerns that one needs to be particularly aware of and you might then increase the scrutiny and things like the the recall rates and stuff like that you might you might use them just to keep be on the safe side yeah thank you great well uh, tricky but I'd, so yeah. I, i'd like to I'd, <laughs> I'd love to hear more about your work so fantastic thank you yeah uh, it's a brilliant question, Professor Brunsky. Brilliant. Um, uh, Professor Bruno, would you like to um, ask any further questions? Oh, sure. I mean, um, I've been practicing radiology, as I mentioned earlier, for quite a long time. And when I first started uh, in my training, this, on the very first day of training, uh, the boss gave us all pointers. And uh, the idea would be that we would be talking to clinicians every day. And we would point to things on the images and there would be this dialogue and communication. Well, that abruptly ended uh, in, in sort of the middle of my career with the introduction of uh, picture archiving systems. The clinicians just simply stopped coming. And uh, what, what what happened was that entire rich Good point, yeah, the two-way conversation that we used to have mm. was completely gone. And instead, everything had to go into our written report. Yeah. And now the written report is under so much pressure and it's such a limited forum uh, so I've been, uh, you know, trying to teach my residents and also uh, practice myself the idea that we need to communicate forthrightly in our written report our level of certainty or uncertainty <laughs> without creating a vague report. Mm -hmm. And this is a real challenge. It's mm -hmm. easy to be vague, but it's, mm -hmm. it's harder to be forthright in, in, mm -hmm. in communicating uncertainty. And I was wondering if, from your work, work uh, trying to communicate uncertainty, if you have any advice. Uh, for the radiologists out there who are trying to grapple with this themselves well, or teach their trainees? I, I, endless other areas have tried to deal with this, particularly the intelligence community, because they've there have been all sorts of disasters in the past, Bay of Pigs, et cetera, where people using words, um, you know, to say, oh, it's likely something's there or it's very likely or it could, something could be there or maybe has been hugely misinterpreted by different audiences. And so the intelligence community, every so many communities have developed their scales so that they can use words like likely, but they try to give them some sort of interpretation. So that um, so that if in climate change, likely is ah, between 60 percent and 85 percent, I think, or something like that. And very unlikely. So every word has been given a rough range of numbers so that to try to impose some consistency on the way that people use words. So it means the reports are still readable. Because you don't want to have loads of numbers in there that makes them very um, stodgy. But it's it's actually more precise than you think it might be because there is an accompanying table that says how these words are being used. Now that's be that's used in all right throughout climate change. IPCC use that all the time, and the intelligence community use it um, during the different So there's this is quite widely, and I wonder whether um, um, maybe something like that has been tried already 
Um, and it prevents someone having to be too precise because if you can just use words like that, and it's got a broad range, but at least you know which side of 50 50 it is, and it's not as high as that, you know, you get a ballpark figure, which is all you can do. You can't be precise about how likely something is to be there. So I think, you know, we know from other, other experience, endless experience, that just using words can be very misleading um, because everyone interprets them differently. Um, but words that have been given some sort of calibration, some sort of mean, you know, some sort of agreement. So to improve observer agreement between uncertainty terms, I, I, I it's become, you know, very widely used and um, the, the, all through COVID, um, you know, uh, the scientific advice in COVID, when the word likely was used, you could look up a table to say, see what people meant. So I, I kind of think that might be worth exploring if it hasn't been already. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, the other question that that I wanted to talk to you about is uh, uh, has to do with Bayesian inference and Bayesian oh, yeah. reasoning, which is something that uh, is near and dear to my heart. I think in radiology we rely on it yeah, a lot absolutely. because everything tends to look like everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, we we have to go with the pretest probability to yeah. get our final yeah. uh, probability. Um, but um, um, you know, doctors do tend to dichotomize and they, you know, they like to, they like everything to be grouped into a yes or a no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and again, it's a sort of a struggle with that. Uh, do you have advice as to how doctors could better use Bayesian reasoning and, and Bayesian inference? I, I mean, it's a problem. It's always, I mean, in diagnosis, but particularly in screening tests, we know how, um, how misleading you know, ideas of false positive rates or sensitivity and specificity can be because if something's rare, you can have 95% sensitivity and specificity, and yet most positives are still false positives. And we know that uh, that amazing reason, but it is quite subtle and quite tricky. Um, we did in COVID trying to explain. So in June, you know, uh, most people from June 2021, most people who died from COVID had been fully vaccinated. Now, trying to explain, which is a simple Bayesian argument, is just that most people have been vaccinated and the vaccine isn't perfect. And so actually you end up that most people who die have been fully vaccinated. Trying to explain that is really quite tricky um, to, an, to an audience or to the media, to skeptics. Um, the, the, way, the way that we, I, I learned to do it was through car crashes. Most people who die in car accidents are wearing seatbelts. But it doesn't mean that seatbelts don't help or are dangerous it's just that most people wear seatbelts and then they are, are not completely effective so th th those sorts of stories i think can help the the fact is difficult that you got you do have this um you know if if um if something is rare you know most tests will be false positives and that is a tricky thing to communicate to people um, and to understand the usual way, you know, it's been recommended again, is to say, what does it mean for 100 people? We've done that for breast cancer screening and things like that out of 200 people. You know, what does it mean in terms of the um, false positives and so on? So how many actually people will get a positive mammogram who um, won't go on to uh, develop you know, clinical cancer? So I, I think that um, I, I, I again this reasoning what we call expected frequencies what does it mean for 100 people is you know well, that's the best way i know to ex try to explain it um and then work through how many have actually got the disease how many false positives and therefore you get these unintuitive or apparently paradoxical results coming up out of out of out of that most tests are false positives when the condition is rare Right, which is really true in all of screening exams. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And by definition, screening is for you know applied to masses of people for something that's rare. Mm -hmm. So you can guarantee that pretty well that most most of the positive results will be false. Mm -hmm. Can I just uh, ask a question, um, Sir David and Professor Bruno? And uh, uh, Professor Bruno has done some beautiful work where he's um, looked at uh, thresholds for requesting a test. Oh, yeah. And that is for pulmonary embolus in the acute setting in A&E where a patient pitches up short of breath and they may have clots in their lungs and very relevant for COVID because COVID causes clots in the lungs. But uh, so um, Professor Bruno looked at this and he basically found that in, in, in his institution and probably in all institutions around the world, once a clinician wants a test, they'll get a reason to request a test. So they'll game the system. Mm. and. Professor Bruno worked very hard on this, but the bottom line is 
once they started to learn the game and they wanted to test, they would game the system. Yeah. So how do we approach that? Oh, that's, man that's management. That's not my job. <laughs> <laughs> incentives incentives you know uh now that is definitely not not my not my job and people do want to know and if they can do it and some it's somebody else's work to do it and, and right. actually i did a follow-up i did a follow-up study on that one john uh where uh, we actually asked you know doctors you know questions about why they made the choices yeah. they made and uh knowing full well that a test a, a particular test was not indicated based on evidence-based guidelines and and apparently the overriding reason was they were too uncomfortable with the uncertainty yep. and it made them sort of grasp at straws. Yep. They okay. knew quite likely that this, this test was not going to answer yep. the question, but they had to do something. Look, there's, um, there's some work being work done with intelligence analysts about um, when are they uncomfortable about giving a judgment about a situation. And it's when they know there's an additional piece of information they could in principle get that could change their mind dramatically. And that seems to be exactly the situation that the doctors are in. They they they're holding back from giving a judgment because they know if we just do this, it probably won't show anything, but it might, and that would change our minds. And right. so we're unwilling to to commit now to make a judgment now. And that is, I think, a standard seems to be a standard. I mean, I feel it myself. Where, where you, people feel least confidence in in giving a judgment when this when that judgment could be susceptible to major change on receipt of further information seems completely reasonable human thing to be and difficult to difficult to counter i think difficult to counter so i think you're up against a really quite fundamental issue here yeah so professor kaprinsky i've got a few questions but is there anything you'd like to um add or ask or professor bruno any more questions there no i don't have anything more yeah no it's up to you <laughs> Take it away, John. <laughs> um, well, Sir David, um, patients will often choose um, a more radical treatment when compared to doctors. Uh, why do you think this is? Um, is it the framing of the discussion by the physician encouraging patients to choose more radical therapy? Is there something else going on? What, what's your take on that type of Oh, I, I again, I, I feel I'm outside my zone here. This is this is very medical and psychology. One possibility is that the doctor has actually seen what the people who have these treatments go through and have an understanding of what the process might be and how damaging and harmful it might be. Um, and patients haven't. They, they only do this journey once. They only get one experience. And they haven't seen what goes on, no matter how, whether people, you can read about things, you can't experience, you can't see what the um, penalties that you can, some people might endure from particular treatments might be. Um, and that, and those are difficult to communicate. And I, 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 I went to a really, really good presentation on palliative care recently, where the other thing is just the, the, you know the the time the loss of time in endless medical appointments and going to things and traveling and being prodded and done things too where actually if you haven't got much long to live maybe you don't want to be doing that maybe you don't want to and that's the sort of thing which i think that you know sensitive clinicians who have seen patient after patient patient know they can they've actually got a real insight the individual patients just cannot it's, this is all completely new and so um, I think it's quite difficult for patients to stand back and have that more balanced view. Um, so I, 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 I think, therefore, that's why it is important that the the benefits and harms of treatments are communicated in a, in a vivid way as possible without being, you know, utterly, without being, you know, necessarily harsh. Um, I think it is it is important, but of course they're uncertain because you don't know. Some people may not have those have those issues, they may not face those issues. So, so I really feel this acts on my zone. Um, but again, I think it's um, it's to do with there's an asymmetry of knowledge there. Yeah, and um, I think for, I, I image and treat cancer and see patients on a daily basis. And um, one of the things that I've learned from other people and reading some of the literature is how important framing is. Mm -hmm. and, um, if you frame something, there's a 90% chance of success and survival, mm -hmm. the rest is a 10% chance of not success and death, mm -hmm. then you'll have a different uh, spectrum of choices. So again, uh, so, what, uh, so from my own practice and people from I've, I've learned from in Leeds and other people around the country, 
is that you do have to give the facts you, uh, and uh, and then let the patient make an informed decision rather than uh, but it, that, that's a challenge because the way that certainly I was taught in the 1990s, I went to Manchester 1990, it was a very paternalistic like yeah. training. That has changed and there's a cultural change. And I think it's changed, uh, well, it's definitely changed for the better. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is changing, still changing more. And I think that's why in the end, out of all our visualizations, I quite like the hundred darts because yeah. it, it's, it's, it, you've got the whole, what's called the part to whole comparison. You're not just talking about things that can go wrong or things that can go right. You're not emphasizing those. So it tries to get away from the framing issue of just talking in terms of survival or mortality, which we know distorts people's perspective. So, um, you know, th that uh, having a hundred darts you know, you do see the whole possible experience. You know, it's sort of, I'm going to throw a dart and one of these is going to be, <laughs> we don't know which one. I mean, I wouldn't use that language myself, but that essentially is what it is. Well, you beautifully described this in one of your lectures of the lightning strikes as well, and the predictable, if you take a thousand lightning strikes, you've got a good idea, take one, it's almost impossible to predict. You can't that. know what's going yeah. to happen. So, so I, I'm, and my particular image I like, um, I use for myself and, uh, I like, I think people use it is that rather than talking about, you know, risk and uncertainty, they just say, well, out of, you know, a hundred possible ways things might turn out for you, a hundred possible futures. We don't know which of these possible futures might be you. And I, I find that a very an engaging imagery because there's only one of me. I've only got, but I, I'm one of these, and that's like leaving a mul some multiverse, you know, I'm only going to go to, go down one of these paths and I just don't know which path it's going to be. Um, I, I like that. It's a metaphor, but I quite like that image for um, talking about the uncertainty about the future. Yeah. And we, if you talked about kind of being um, able to deal with uncertainty, which, um, which we, I think we are getting better, it's quite interesting in one of Lance Armstrong's books. And uh, I read his books before all the uh, drug cheating came out and his whatever behavior came out. But one of the interesting things he said, and uh, from an anecdotal point of view, he went to a the top center for germ cell tumors, testicular cancer centers in the US. And they were so brutal with him as in, this is gonna happen, we're gonna do this, you're gonna be, um, you're gonna, we're gonna almost kill you with chemotherapy and then we're gonna resurrect you like Lazarus. He said, hold on, I don't wanna be in this institution. So he went to the best institution at the exact uh, knowledge, but he was so scared, he went to the adjacent one. So mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a happy medium, it's a kind of, <laughs> It scared and, him off right yeah, just, mm. you can have too much information you can yeah, have, it can yeah, be yeah. too brutal and that that is a real skill which i've learned a lot from other physicians how to communicate depending on the patient that's in front of you and that's yeah. and also you got to recognize it's not it's not just you as as clinicians who could be doing this i mean patient support support groups got an, an increasing role um and i know from my wife's a doctor and she's um you know, it was a spe you know, real specialism. And she says they are extraordinarily good at, at rare conditions, you know, from all over the world. They're contributing their knowledge and their understanding. And um, and they know more about it than the people, most of the people who are treating them. So there's all sorts of other sources of information that are not that can be can be reliable and can give a full spectrum of what's going on. And importantly, they give them more time as well, because certainly yeah. the doctor um, patient interaction can be 20 minutes. It can be yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and a, a, a specialist nurse with time and effort and uh, that more time, they're sometimes often better skills as well. So. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a trend, there's, can I follow up with that? There's a trend now, and a lot of people are looking into it is you know the main communication often between the radiologist and the patient is that written report mm -hmm. and there's a lot of effort now to go into creating a version of the report that's patient friendly yeah yeah and yeah for yeah. the most part that patient friendly version is written at the sixth to eighth grade level yeah, yeah. Uh, because that's what you know the average reading level is and so when you know based on what john just said that you tailor your message to the person in front of you absolutely we're not doing it that's not the goal here and are we doing a disservice perhaps to I, our I, patients communicating I, to them with a dumbed down report yeah or I, report? I i i strongly feel that reports should be level, written at a level that the patients can understand i i deeply value the letters that i get after having seen my consultant who writes to the my general practitioner i get a copy of the letter and he's he's made a real effort to be clear to be to use simple words and and explain things and i think it's in, in, incredibly valuable 
to do this. And if you think you've got it bad, have you seen genetic test reports? My <laughs> God. I mean, they're awful. We are, it's one of our major projects is trying to write a patient-friendly genetic test report with a whole lot of stuff. And stuff. All, the, all the business is at the bottom, but what do I need to know? What's important for me? What does this show? What doesn't it show at the top? Just laid out. And we're trying to get these accepted because the stuff that, I mean, and therefore you know, for patients, but even the, the general practitioners, the, the non-specialist doctors will be struggling to understand I mean, I don't know what they're like in the US, but they're pretty awful here. Pretty awful. Just full of blah, you know, and with no, no real attempt to say, what does this mean? Or how does this help? Or what, you know, how to interpret it? So um, I think that, I think that, you know, our, our experience with PREDICT is that by making things, you know, I wouldn't say dumbing dumb, you know, making them, you know, comprehensible, it benefits everybody. Um, and we, 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 you don't then need one version for the doctors and one version for the patients. Everyone can understand. You don't, I always say we don't need two iPhones. You, get, you have a, one iPhone that's really well designed and then can be used at different levels by people, different levels of sophistication. So it's similarly for these things, you shouldn't have to have two reports. I think they, everybody, everybody values clarity. The practice nurses will really, the specialist nurses will really value, you know, um, a, a, a clearer description so that they can grasp it and pass it on and so on. So it benefits everybody to have led communication of, uh, in, uh, of um, on, on these things. And it, I think harms everybody if it's just written in a, you know, in the most technical, professionally protective way. Yeah. So there's a challenge. It is. That's a great, that's a great insight. And, and I think that's something we struggle with. One of my colleagues actually was experimenting with using chat GPT uh, to, uh, to produce oh, these, these right. uh, well. level re reports. And I, I worry because as you pointed out that uh, chat GPT is. Oh, completely... God. Yeah. No, it writes, bri it writes brilliant. It's, it's, it's unbelievably plausible, but it's complete. <laughs> it can be completely wrong. It's just the most genius con man. <laughs> where most of what it says is reasonable and then it slides in a complete lie when nobody can want to. Thank you so much. I, I think you, you've really given me a lot to go on today. I really appreciate it. Well, uh, again, I feel a bit fraudulent, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk. Thanks. Can I just ask one more question before we wrap it up? Um, uh, uh, Pro uh, Professor Bruno, do you have any more questions? or Professor? No, no. I, I, I no, think I'm we... good. This has been awesome. Yeah, this has been wonderful. Uh, may I ask one question, uh, final question, Sir David, and you've had, uh, medicine is a complex system. Uh, you started your career in computer-aided detection. You finished your career, well, uh, focusing on informing the patient of possible outcomes. So where do you think computer-aided detection uh, has a future? Where, where do you think the future of computer-aided detection is? I, I mean, I, again, I was, I was working on this computer-aided diagnosis and test results and things 45 years ago. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And it was great. And people were having these conversations. Essentially. But now we're actually getting so that, you know, almost identical conversations. But now it's becoming really practical. And these are you're coming up against the pointy end of this stuff in that people really there is the opportunity to use these things. So I think that a lot of the discussions people have been having for ages about the principles that we're having now suddenly oh my God, we've actually got to face up to this stuff. This is no longer little, you know, th people in the corner talking about, um, this is really serious because there's going to be all sorts of products out there. There's going to be people, there's stuff you can just access. I mean, it, it, just Google has, has been big of enough of an influence, but uh, I think it's nothing to what we're going to see in the future. So um, it's terribly important, as I said. That, and so what the answers are with it in terms of training regulation um etc cetera, etc cetera. trustworthiness indices you know i i i'm not going to say what is the answer to this but it is a challenge and it's got huge potential benefits and considerable potential harms and i'm glad it's your job to deal with it <laughs> well, we're lucky because it's a it's a it's a topic that stimulates us it's a topic that we we're interested in and it's a topic that needs a lot of work and uh, so it's um it's been brilliant speaking to the team here this morning and uh i really want to thank everyone for taking the time out uh you're all brilliant busy academics um uh, some semi-retired and still working very hard and i'd just like to thank sir david professor bruno uh, professor kaprinsky and joe in the background who's going to support this and so we'll wrap the session up